Hi, and welcome to Jules Voto's Photo Focus. In the last installment of this series, I talked about how we use aperture and shutter speed to obtain proper exposure. In this video, I'm going to explain more about aperture and shutter speed. So let's talk about aperture first. We know that a large aperture lets in a lot of light, and smaller apertures let in less light. But a large aperture also gives you less depth of field, and smaller apertures give you more depth of field. So you ask, what is depth of field, and why is it important? When you focus a lens at a certain distance, let's say 10 feet, as we see here on this lens, okay, there is an area in front of and behind the focus distance that will be acceptably sharp. That range of acceptable focus is known as depth of field, also sometimes referred to as depth of focus. So for the, in this example here with this lens, if we focus this lens on a subject that's 10 feet away, okay, as we have it set here, and with this 50 millimeter lens set to an aperture of f8, the depth of field would extend from approximately 7 feet 9 inches to 14 feet. Now we could see this on the depth of field scale on this lens. You see the aperture here set to f8. Let me use a pointer. f8. You also notice below the distance scale you see an 8 here and an 8, an 8 here. Okay? What that does is it shows you the range of the depth of field. So the near distance, you could see it's the 8 is a little bit more than at the 7, than the 7 foot mark. The, the numbers in yellow, by the way, are meters. And we could also see that it's the 8 at this end, on the left side of the lens, is just below 15 feet. And this depth of field scale that you see on this lens is on almost all manual focus lenses and that will give you an approximation of the depth of field. So there's another way, of course, to observe depth of field in this Pentax lens. You have a um, switch here, actually it's set to manual now, and as you close down the lens, you can actually observe depth of field on the focus screen. Other cameras have a button, such as this Nikromat. If you want to observe depth of field, you could press the button. The aperture, the view through the viewfinder will get dark, but you will be able to observe depth of field. On this Nikon, the button is on the front. So it depends on the camera, but most manual focus 35 millimeter cameras, most autofocus 35 millimeter cameras, and even many digital cameras do have a depth of field, what they call a depth of field preview, and you could observe the depth of field. So if this 50 millimeter lens on this Pentax was set to, let's say, f4, which is a wider aperture, lets in more light, we would have less depth of field. You could see where the 4 is. Okay, it's pretty close to 10 feet. And on the other side, I guess it's about 12 feet. So as you open your aperture to a wider opening, you have less depth of field. As you close it down to a smaller opening, a bigger number, you have more depth of field. Now, there's more to depth of field than just aperture. The main factors that control depth of field are, of course, the aperture, the focal length of the lens. When I say focal length of the lens, I mean this is a 50 millimeter lens. Here on this Nikon, we have a 35 millimeter lens. Okay, so the wider the lens, the more depth of field for a given aperture and focus distance. The longer the lens, such as a 50 or a 105 or a 200 millimeter lens, as the lenses get longer into that telephoto range, they have less depth of field. Okay? And wide angle lenses have more than normal lenses. And the wider you go, the more depth of field for a given focus distance and aperture. Okay? Now, one other thing distance from the subject. So that's one of the three factors that affect depth of field. Aperture, 
focal length of the lens and distance to the subject. The closer you are to a subject with a given lens and a given aperture, the less depth of field. So a wide angle lens at 10 feet from the subject will give you more depth of field than a 50 millimeter lens at 10 feet from the subject. When we get to five feet from the subject, the wide angle lens is still giving you more depth of field than the 50, but less depth of field than when you were at 10 feet. That's why you will see in close up photography, photographs of insects, flowers, and so forth, there's very shallow depth of field, very little depth of field because you are so close to your subject. And the further you are from the subject, the more depth of field. Now there's one other thing to consider besides the distance as far as the depth of field. If the image size, let's say, let me explain this better. Let's say you're using a 50 millimeter lens at five feet and you're using, a, and then you switch to a 35 millimeter lens at five feet. Okay, the depth of field with that 35 millimeter lens is going to be more. But let's say you moved in with that 35 millimeter lens and to give you the same image size as you got with the 50 at the greater distance. Okay, so now on the film, that picture of a whatever it is, a flower, is approximately the same size as you look through the viewfinder appears just as close as when you use the 50 at a greater distance. Your depth of field will be the same. I know that's a little confusing. You could just put that aside while you learn about depth of field and come back to it later. But just know that wide angle lenses, as long as the distance from the subject is the same as longer lenses, wide angles will give you greater depth of field. Now, you could use this for a lot of creative purposes. As you all know, probably cell phones have a portrait option. And what that basically does is gives you less depth of field so that the background is out of focus on a portrait. You may be photographing someone in a busy situation, a, not a great background, a lot going on. By using a wide aperture, you know you're going to get less depth of field. Using a tele, that's why telephoto lenses, 85s and 105s and 135 millimeter lenses, are very useful for portraits. Uh, one of the reasons is they give you less depth of field, and you could throw that background out of focus, especially if you're using wide apertures. That's why, you know, 1.4, very expensive lenses, 1.4 telephoto lenses, 105s or 85s are expensive. They're very expensive but they give you very little depth of field when photographing portraits. Now, if you're doing landscape photography, most cases, you want great depth of field. You want the tree in the foreground to be sharp as well as the mountain in the background. So in a lot of cases, you will use a wide angle lens and you will close it down to maybe F8 or F11, possibly even F16. And I know I mentioned close-up photography, but you have very, very little depth of field, almost non-existent when you get into a life-size situation. For example, let's say we're photographing a postage stamp and we want it to fill the frame. Well, a normal postage stamp, a commemorative type postage stamp, if you fill the frame with it, you are at what's called one-to-one, -one, one to one magnification. The image on the film is the same size as the image in real life. There's absolutely no depth of field. Now when photographing a postage stamp, not a problem because it's a flat object. But if you're photographing a flower at one-to-one, -one, only a small portion of that flower will be in focus. So there are techniques, especially with more modern cameras, something called focus stacking, but that's a subject for another day. In order to make this a little more clear, we're going to look at a few pictures. I did a little setup in my basement, 
with some cereal boxes and a mannequin head to show you a little bit about depth of field with uh, a few different lenses. So here's the setup. I uh, set up these cereal boxes on a table. The one in the middle was the focus distance of seven feet with a 50 millimeter lens at 2.8. And you could see that the box in the front, which was five feet from the camera and the box in the back, which was 10 feet away, are out of focus. Same setup, I stopped the lens down to 5.6, still the focus was on the middle box. And you see the fiber one has sharpened up a little bit and so has the one in the back. And then we go to F11 and the fiber one is very sharp and so is the one in the back. So F11 gives us a nice range of depth of field. I then switched lenses, I went with a 35 millimeter lens, same focus distance, seven feet. And at 2.8, we get more depth of field than we did with the 50. You notice that fiber one is sharper than it was in the 2.8 shot with the 50. Then I stopped down to 5.6. And again, because we're stopping down, sharpness is increasing. And by the time we get to F11 in this shot right here, we could see that everything is in sharp focus. So a wide angle will give you more depth of field at the same focus distance as a 50 we have just shown. Now I went to an 85 focused on the mannequin head at 1.8. It was seven feet away. The flowers in the background are in 13 feet. Uh, for me, this isn't out of focus enough. If the mannequin head had been further from the background, those flowers would be more out of focus. I then stopped the lens down to 5.6. And um, if we're doing a portrait here, this is just too sharp for me uh, for the background. So the wide aperture does give you much less depth of field. I then went to uh, 200 millimeter lens at 2.8 at 10 feet from the mannequin head. Flowers are 16 feet away. And the background is fairly soft. I'd like it even softer. So if, if that, again, if the background had been further away, and when we go to uh, 5.6 at 200, we get more sharpness in the background. All right, so now that we're clear on depth of field, I hope, and if you have any questions anytime in any of these videos, please ask a question in the description below, send me an email. I'd be more than happy to answer your questions and help you understand these concepts. So now let's get into shutter speed. Again, from the previous video on exposure, we know that slow shutter speeds let in more light to the film than fast shutter speeds. But there's another very important thing about shutter speed. Fast shutter speeds will stop action. An example would be a football player going up for a catch. We use a fast shutter speed the shutter is only open for a split second and it actually stops the action. If we had used a slow shutter speed on this football player, let's say a 15th of a second, it would be a total blur because in that 15th of a second, a person could move pretty far. So if you want to, if you want to take a picture of your child on a trampoline, you want to use a fast shutter speed, maybe a 500th or a 1,000th of a second. Now, there are charts available to show you what speeds are recommended for different types of action. And remember, if the subject is moving parallel to the camera, okay, across the frame, you need a faster shutter speed than if the subject is moving towards you. So let's say you're using a 15th of a second shutter speed and you're photographing a runner moving parallel to the camera. Well, in that 15th of a second, that subject's gonna move a good bit in the frame. However, if it's coming towards you, the apparent movement in the frame isn't going to be as much, okay? So again, if the subject is moving parallel to the camera, you need a faster shutter speed than if the subject is moving towards the camera or even if it's moving, a, let's say, a 45 degree angle towards the camera. So if you want to stop action, you need a fast shutter speed. And you, again, you could experiment with this with different shutter speeds. If you, know, if you have someone that could model for you, could run 
towards you could run parallel to the uh, camera, you could experiment with different speeds and see how you can stop that action, what speed will actually work for you, a speeding car, to photographing a uh, auto automobile race, or uh, your cat running across the room, you could experiment with different shutter speeds. Now, what about if you want to show the effect of motion, if you want to give the appearance of motion? Okay, several things you can do. You can use a slow shutter speed. So now that person is running parallel to the camera. You try different slow shutter speeds. Now, you don't want a total blur, but usually the feet are moving faster than the rest of the, of the body. So you maybe if you so if you choose just the correct shutter speed, you may show the legs, the feet with a little bit of a blur to kind of indicate motion. You could also use an effect known as panning. You select a slow shutter speed, let's say a 15th of a second, as that subject is running by you parallel to the camera. You press the shutter release and you actually move the camera in a nice steady motion with the subject. So if the subject's moving right to left, you move your camera right to left. And you can see in this picture here, the background looks blurred, the subject is partially blurred, and it gives that effect of motion. If you do it just right, you may have a nearly perfectly sharp subject, but a background that shows that motion, that shows as if you, if you looked out at a window of a car on the passenger side, let's say, as you're speeding down the highway past some trees, those trees look like a blur. So that kind of gives you that effect by panning. So you have creative uses for both shutter speed and aperture, and obviously they work in conjunction one another to give you proper exposure. So what if you're photographing, let's say a high school basketball game, you need a fast shutter speed to stop the action, but also the light in some of these uh, gyms, some of these high school gyms is not very bright, so you may have to use a high speed film, a high ISO film, and you may have to use a wide aperture. But now with a wide aperture, your depth of field isn't that great, so you have to be very careful with your focus. So all these things, it's kind of a compromise. You know, you got to stop the action, so you need the fast shutter speed. You want to keep the player in focus, especially if the player is coming towards you. We know the shutter speed doesn't have to be quite as high if the subject was going parallel, but if the subject is coming towards you, it might be difficult to keep that subject in focus at a wide aperture because there's so little depth of field. So you got to play around with these things, uh, and it's usually a compromise to get the perfect picture. Not only do you need a fast shutter speed to stop action, such as a runner, you also should use a faster shutter speed to prevent camera shake or blur induced by you, the photographer. There's a rule of thumb for that. If the focal length of the lens, let's say, is 100 millimeters, then you should use a shutter speed closest to that. In this case, it would be 1 1 25th of a second. If you're using a 50 millimeter lens, your minimum shutter speed to prevent camera shake should be 1 60th of a second. I have a video on holding a camera steady, and I will put a link to that in the description below. But that's something you can practice just holding the camera steady in order to avoid blur induced by the photographer. Okay, so that's it for this video. If you like it, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I come out with a new video every Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. Now, I am placing in the description below a link to the first two videos in this series. The first one on the camera, the second one on exposure. And I'm not sure what the next one's going to be, but these videos are published the first Wednesday of every month. So as I said before, if you have any questions, if there's certain things you would like me to talk about, please send me an email, 
or leave your question in the description below. Thank you very much. I will talk to you next time.